welcome to the last of the lectures. Actually, there are so many interesting historic landscapes in Florida that we could do two or three more courses, but I don't think I've got the strength. Uh, <clears throat> today, um, I'm going to talk about William Lyman Phillips, uh, who made the greatest contribution to Florida landscape uh, design of any single person. And I don't know about you, but I really was not familiar with William Lyman Phillips until I started the research for this course. Uh, <clears throat> very remiss and being so ignorant. But uh, Phillips is Florida's version of the far more famous uh, Frederick Law Olmsted uh, Sr., a name which is uh, synonymous with uh, the creation of New York's New York City's Central Park um, beginning in 1857. Uh, <clears throat> he um, uh, then uh, began uh, his career in landscape architecture, taking a, a break for the Civil War where he served with the Union. Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, after that uh, time, uh, beginning in 1857, again uh, with Central Park, a break for the war, then um, a partnership with George Vox, um, I mean, Calvert Vox, which lasted until uh, I believe 1883. But um, uh, during that uh, the period of the firm of the Olmsteads, which lasted until 1979, um, their work was simply uh, ubiquitous in the United States. In fact, uh, in 1921, Gainesville's home for the feeble-minded corresponded with the firm, although no plan uh, emerged, I suppose, because the Gainesville Home for the Feeble-Minded couldn't afford to uh, carry out the project. Between 1925 and 1927, the Olmsted firm provided 39 plans for the University of Florida. Uh, today, the only identifiable evidence of those plans is the area between um, Smathers Library East um, and uh, uh, Peabody Chrysler. Um, that uh, uh, landscape is very identifiable with the plan, one of the plans that the Olmsted firm did for the University of Florida. Um, <clears throat> I once had a copy of the plan and gave it to the library. Uh, so I'm sorry I can't share it with you, but it was a very interesting plan for what I consider the historic campus. Um, <clears throat> well, Olmsted believed that the that scenery could have a powerful restorative, restorative effect on uh, people, so people in general. The, the psychological power of scenery, he believed, could be achieved in landscape design only through subordination of all elements to the creation of a single effect. This was what he called his principle of unity. And William Lyman Phillips subscribed to this formal principle of unity um, <clears throat> in which the site, the scene, the landscape, and the buildings should be studied as one composition. Uh, <clears throat> and in uh, Phillips' case, the path to Florida is a really interesting one one which uh, often intersected with the Olmsteads. Um, in the late 1800s, a young Charles Elliott, an Olmsted firm partner and son of legendary Harvard president, Charles W. Elliott, died prematurely. And President Elliott, <laughs> dropping my notes, President Elliott 
honoring his son's uh, argument for a, a professional degree in landscape architecture at Harvard, founded such a program in 1900. And in 1903, awarded the um, Charles Elliott Professorship to Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. As a student in this program, Phillips realized his own dedication to the senior and junior Olmsted's shared principle of unity as an overarching idea and a goal in landscape design. Upon Phillips' graduation from the Harvard program in 1910, he soon joined the Olmsted firm, by now permanently located in Brookline, Massachusetts. I want to start the photos now. So, so this is um, a building that is uh, really important for anybody who's seriously interested in the history of landscape architecture uh, in the United States. This is Fairstead, F-A-I-R-S-T-E-D. Uh, <clears throat> it's um, the um, home and studio that um, Olmsted Sr. created when he severed his relationship with uh, uh, Calvert Box in New York in 1883. Uh, I'm not sure of the reason that that association came to an end, but Calvert Box is also known as um, an architect and in fact uh, <clears throat> designed a home that was right up the street from uh, in Oxford, Mississippi. Um, it was a house called Amadel and is now a National Historic Landmark. So Calvert Box had moved heavily into architecture. And <clears throat> when, uh, when Olmsted made the move to the Boston area, he settled in Brookline, um, primarily because uh, this property was very close to H.H. H. Richardson, um, one of our nation's most famous architects. In fact, uh, along with Palladio, whose name uh, gave itself to Palladian architecture, Richardson is the one American, I think, uh, who is comparable in the sense of uh, our reference to Richardsonian Romanesque as a distinct style in the United States from the 19th century. So uh, <clears throat> Olmsted was able to purchase this property. <clears throat> what you see is what he eventually turned it into, um, existing there and incorporated in this uh, structure is an 1810 wooden uh, structure. Uh, and I think that uh, it looks rather casual, uh, <clears throat> but it's not casual at all. Um, <clears throat> and it's a, an example of uh, his uh, lineage, I suppose, beginning with William Kent and Capability Brown in England, uh, coming on down through um, Sir Humphrey Repton, and then jumping to the United States uh, in the person of Andrew Jackson Downing, who was probably our best known landscape architect uh, <clears throat> early in the 1800s, up until the mid 1800s. And it was um, Downing, uh, who along with Calvert Box had persuaded uh, <clears throat> New York City to buy the 800 plus acres that became Central Park. That was in 1853. Um, <clears throat> as they began the design, um, Downing, unfortunately, uh, was drowned in a, in a boating accident. And that was when uh, Box prevailed upon uh, Olmsted to join him in the plan for Central Park, which certainly is the uh, beginning of major landscape architecture in the United States in, in terms of public spaces. You recall, we looked at the, the property in Charleston that's considered the first designed landscape in the United States. Uh, but uh, of course that was uh, private. So in terms of public landscape architecture, Central Park is the beginning. Olmsted was one of the two principals. 
but in 1883, he moved here to Brookline, Massachusetts, uh, <clears throat> added to the existing structure, and in addition, uh, built his studio. What you're seeing on the rear there is part of the studio jutting out. Uh, <clears throat> this dark uh, color, the 1810 house was actually uh, painted white, but his daughter suggests suggested this dark palette as better fitting the naturalistic setting that he was uh, incorporating. And um, no. And here you have a very interesting screen at the front of the property, uh, a series of palings, if you will, of different uh, heights, not at all what I would have expected. Uh, <clears throat> those are two of my great grandsons hiding, hiding uh, over to the left. <clears throat> Not a usual part of the landscape. Um, <clears throat> this is, uh, again, it, it's a must for anyone seriously interested in landscape architecture in, in the US. Um, <clears throat> The, um, the firm functioned in this property until 1979. Um, after Homestead Sr. died, it was no longer a residence for a period, but uh, the studio always functioned. The, the family leased out the living portion of the property, but the studio continued until 1979. And in 1979, it was acquired by uh, the National Park Service. It's now a National Historic Site, and it is open to the public uh, through the National Park Service. Um, <clears throat> and I strongly urge you to pay a visit when you're in the Boston area. What I'm showing you here is uh, the director showing me uh, something that uh, those of you who were in the Garden as History course will appreciate. You remember uh, Sir Humphrey Repton who was um, a good salesman, came up with something called his uh, red books. His red books now at auction go for tens of thousands of dollars. But uh, when a client came to him, he prepared a red book, called a red book because they were bound in uh, beautiful red leather. And <clears throat> on uh, different pages, he would have sketches of what the client's property looked like at the moment. And then you lift a flap and the client can see what the property could look like if Repton, Sir Humphrey Repton's plan was uh, carried out. And <clears throat> this is uh, directly, directly, directly related to uh, Capability Brown because he got his nickname Capability because he um, <clears throat> would tell clients what their properties were capable of uh, <clears throat> looking like. But uh, Repton carried this a step further with actual sketches. Uh, <clears throat> so again, this is a, a very exciting place to, to visit. And uh, the director gave me before I left a, a guide or not a guide, but a directory to every project the uh, firm was ever uh, remotely interested in over a period from 1883 to uh, 1979. And that's where I found the information about the Gainesville Home for the Feeble-Minded and the uh, University of Florida campus. Uh, there are hundreds, if not over a thousand, plans done for various clients in Florida alone. So again, the Olmstead firm was, was truly ubiquitous. Uh, <clears throat> well, to, uh, to, to go forward with the career of uh, Phillips and how he eventually got to Florida, um, <clears throat> upon graduation from the Harvard program in 1910, uh, he joined the firm at this uh, studio and uh, worked there until uh, 1913. And in 1913, 
he decided <clears throat> to uh, take a break and spent several months studying European landscapes and then was awarded the position of landscape architect for, quote, the design and construction of the new town of Balboa, unquote, for the uh, Panamain, uh, Panama Isthmian, Isthmian Canal Commission, where he lived on site for the next 16 months. Well, this is Balboa as it was eventually built out. And I know we have residents here in Okamak who were uh, born and raised in, in Balboa. Um, <clears throat> Well, after that 16 months, he moved on. He did not get along well, apparently, with General Gothels, who was the overall supervisor of construction of the Panama Canal. Uh, <clears throat> and for the next 10 years, he moved around the United States, um, taking on various jobs and positions. And then finally, he found a permanent home in Florida. He first settled on Florida's uh, west coast, um, <clears throat> where he planned a new town for the island of Boca Grande to be, to be developed by a chemical company. Now, Boca Grande already was popular with fisher persons, particularly from the Boston area. And <clears throat> this is uh, the current uh, state of the Gasparilla Inn, which first opened in the season 1911 and 12. And it was... Uh, added on to remodeled uh, ever since. Um, <clears throat> well, the company decided to abandon real estate development, uh, fortunately for Boca Grande, and Phillips then renewed his association with the Olmstead firm when he began work <clears throat> on Mountain Lake Sanctuary and its Singing Tower now popularly known as Bach Tower Gardens. Uh, apparently, the original name was just too long to go on highway signs. And so uh, uh, the Department of Transportation quickly shortened it to Bach Tower and Bach Tower Gardens. Uh, but Edward Bach, <clears throat> who was a Dutch immigrant and editor of the Ladies Home Journal, began planning the sanctuary uh, at Mountain Lake in 1922. Uh, and incidentally, he had had a lot of influence uh, in Florida in terms of saving uh, our plumed birds, the egrets in particular. Uh, Lady Home Ladies Home Journal under uh, Bach was, was pretty activist. And that was one of the, the things they took on to slot, stop the slaughter of the uh, birds, particularly in South Florida, but also throughout the state where, where egrets uh, were. And originally, uh, Bach's sanctuary was to be a landscape for the use and pleasure of his own family and his neighbors in the adjoining gated Mountain Lake Colony. However, at some point during the garden's development, he decided to share his creation with the public. And Bach later said that uh, the seeds which grew into Bach Tower Gardens were planted by his Dutch grandparents. First, by his grandfather, who more than 150 years earlier had joined his friends and neighbors in transforming a grim desert island in the North Sea into a green haven covered with trees and shrubs, uh, <clears throat> which uh, attracted birds in such numbers and varieties that they have become uh, famous. Uh, and the island is much visited today as a result of what his grandfather started. And then next, his grandmother uh, gave her children and her grandchildren this command. Wherever your lives may be cast, make you the world a better or more beautiful because you have lived in it. And so fortunately, um, the box had an obedient grandchild. And for creating his sanctuary, 
Bach acquired 157 acres on the north side of Iron Mountain uh, <clears throat> with its 205 foot tower that you're looking at. Uh, this is the highest point in Peninsula, Florida. Without the tower, uh, at only 289 feet above sea level, it is bested on the peninsula by Sugarloaf Mountain near Claremont at 312 feet above sea level. But neither reaches the majesty of the Florida Panhandle's Britain Hill, uh, north of the Funiac Springs and almost in Alabama. It's all of 345 feet above sea level. Um, <clears throat> it uh, uh, is marked by a very small county park. Uh, it's a great place for Bloody Marys if you're there in the morning. I've never seen another person there other than uh, my own party. So you will have it to yourself. Well, Box property adjoined Fred Ruth's 2000 acres of Orange Grove and his resort community of 500 acres, which was called, still is, Mountain Lake Colony. Uh, well, Ruth had hired the country's leading landscape firm, the Olmstead firm, uh, <clears throat> to design Mountain Lake Colony. So Bach selected the firm as well to design his sanctuary. Uh, Olmstead Sr. had retired in 1895, but the son took over as principal and headed the firm until his death in, uh, until his retirement in 1949. He died six or seven years later. Well, William Lyman Phillips became the chief project designer of the sanctuary, representing the Olmstead firm in Lake Wales from the uh, inception of work on the property in 1924 until its completion in 1931. And Phillips collaborated with Olmsted Jr. on the design and construction of the sanctuary and directed all of the site work. In addition, Phillips designed a number of gardens for homeowners in the adjoining Mountain Lake Colony. Together at Box Sanctuary, Olmsted Jr and Phillips confirmed the principle of unity, the first Frederick Law Olmsted's view that a landscape design should enable people to form an idea of a place that would stay with them. And I think you will agree, anyone who's visited Bach Tower Gardens uh, thinks about that tower reflected in the, in the water. I think they take away that, uh, unified idea, if you will. Um, <clears throat> at first glance, the tower has a vaguely Gothic look. It's not moving forward. At first glance, the tower has a vaguely Gothic look, um, perhaps um, a touch of the French Renaissance, but on closer examination, it is one of our nation's Art Deco masterpieces. Of course, it was built at the height of Art Deco. And although Milton B. Madari of Philadelphia was the architect of the tower, the work of three other uh, celebrated uh, Philadelphians contribute to the effect of the overall design. Madari, incidentally, uh, did many other famous buildings in the United States. I know he did the the tower at uh, Cornell, um, uh, many others. Uh, <clears throat> the tower's pink and gray veined marble came from Tate, Georgia. The, uh, the uh, tan coquina rock between the ribs was quarried from Anastasia Island off St. Augustine, the same stone from the same source for the construction of St. Augustine's Castillo between 1672 and uh, 1695. Well, a riot of Florida uh, wildlife designed by Lee Laurie, again from Philadelphia, decorates the tower in the form of sculptures, uh, pelicans, herons, flamingos, 
uh, geese, swans, among others. And the crown of the tower <clears throat> is comprised of eight figures of cock and hen herons with nests and young joined by a sculptured marble screen of palms and roses. In the upper portion of the tower, uh, <clears throat> Dunley, um, J.H. Dulles Island, using earthenware decorated with uh, opaque colored glazes has created the uh, colorful grills. Well, the grills are functional they enclosed the bell chamber at the top of the tower, allowing the sound from the carillon to flow freely in every direction. The carillon, the carillon itself consists of 53 tuned bronze bells cast in Loughborough, England. <clears throat> The seven levels inside the tower are due to uh, function, not open to the public uh, ever. Although I have twice been to the top with students from UF's Historic Preservation Program. Uh, even so, the tower's interior is as much a work of art as the exterior. Here is a view out and um, iron work uh, done by Yellen in the form of a lantern. Um, <clears throat> my favorite tower feature is the broad iron work by Yellen. This is a photograph I took of some of the detail on the bridge across the moat. And if you look closely, you can see the variety in each of those, those birds he has created. Um, incidentally, when the pension building in Washington was converted to the National Building Museum some 20 or 25 years ago. Uh, <clears throat> there were two uh, American craftsmen who were honored with uh, uh, exhibits uh, at that opening, and one of the two was Samuel Yellen. Uh, we also uh, heard from uh, Richard Farwell uh, <clears throat> describing Yellen's work um, at Vizcaya. Uh, the third site at which Kellen has work in Florida is the Sarasota County Courthouse. In any event, he is, he is clearly our <clears throat> nation's leading uh, iron artist. Um, <clears throat> and Yellen also designed and created, uh, executed the tower's great brass entry gate. Um, <clears throat> or door, I suppose we should say, which depicts from the book of Genesis, the biblical story of the creation and the fall of man in 30 distinct panels. This is one of those panels. Although I have not seen this suggested elsewhere, I believe he was clearly inspired by Ghiberti's uh, Gates of Paradise and the baptistry uh, outside Florence's Duomo. Here's a close up of the gates um, <clears throat> and the detail of one of the panels. Um, and incidentally, when you look at the gates of paradise now, you're not seeing the originals. The originals have all been moved to the, to the Duomo's uh, museum behind the Duomo. And uh, these are reproductions that you see now, but believe me, you can't tell the difference. So, um, although the, uh, the singing tower is the focus of Bach Tower Gardens, without the landscape first envisioned by Olmsted Jr., in fact, uh, his diary describes uh, his planning his initial planning, the concept while on a train trip across the United States. Uh, <clears throat> without the, the landscape surrounding it, the context carried out by, by Phillips, the overall uh, experience of a visit 
would be enormously diminished. The end result epitomizes the formal principle of unity shared by the Olmsted Senior and Junior and William Lyman Phillips. Um, <clears throat> and uh, although I visited Bach Tower often since my first visit in 1954, uh, I wanna share a few photos taken in 2004 during a celebration of the 75th anniversary of the formal opening of the sanctuary by President Coolidge in 1929 actually two years before completion, but that's when the dedication occurred. And fortunately it did because not long after that, Bach himself died and he never saw it to completion. But um, here's a, what I think is an interesting photo. Um, it shows Olmsted's original principle of contrast between open and closed spaces. Uh, here, uh, our native Ilex vomitoria uh, has been pruned uh, in a very formal way, really, to um, open up the view and let in light. Um, <clears throat> and although I don't know, I don't know that uh, the use of a fallen aged tree trunk as an object to be surrounded by annuals here, um, a mixture of violas is a legacy of Olmsted. I think it's very effective. In another part of the grounds, um, the same effect with the use of uh, massing cyclamens. This, incidentally, these photographs were made in April when uh, it was still cool enough for these uh, annuals to, to thrive in Florida. Um, <clears throat> A relatively recent addition to the visitor experience is admission to the 1920s Mediterranean Revival Pinewood, uh, gifted by an owner of this property, which is part of Mountain Lake Colony, which directly abuts uh, the sanctuary. And it can be accessed only by foot uh, from Bach Tower Gardens. Mountain Lake Colony remains a very exclusive uh, gated community. Here's another view. Um, and incidentally, uh, except for this year, for the past few years since it was gifted, uh, it has been decorated elaborately for Christmas and is open to the public um, from about Thanksgiving until the first of the year uh, with, with its decorations. I'm assuming it will be again next year, and that's a great time to visit both the gardens and Pinewood. Um, the wall you're seeing is interesting. On one of my uh, trips there with uh, uh, one of the UF preservation uh, field, a field trip, um, Herschel Shepherd, who is our uh, outstanding premier living uh, historic preservation architect in Florida. Uh, Herschel pointed out this, this wall and said that uh, when they were doing paint samples to determine how to treat the exterior of the building, they discovered that it was never painted in the traditional sense, that instead using the Tuscan technique, the color is in the mortar itself and the plaster itself. So all they did was to clean it, uh, it, it's not repainted. So what you're seeing is the original treatment from the 1920s. Uh, <clears throat> well, so much for Bach Tower. Um, <clears throat> we wanna move now to uh, McKee Jungle Gardens near, uh, or in Vero Beach actually. Um, <clears throat> this is, uh, from 1932, and doesn't that look like a 1932 sign? Uh, <clears throat> by the time of completion of Bach Tower Gardens in 1931, Phillips uh, uh, was now based in, in Miami and was the consulting landscape architect for the 80 acre McKee Jungle Gardens located along the east side of US-1 in Vero Beach. 
And here, a single guiding principle prevailed in Phillips' design for McKee, the principle of contrast in garden design. This principle saw contrast as the solution to the first problem, how to stop people who were speeding down uh, Highway uh, US-1 at 60 miles per hour, uh, because at that time, they were passing through miles of natural hammock uh, along US-1. Uh, the development that we see now uh, did not exist in 1931. So the solution anchored in the principle of contrast was to catch their interest with a striking change in the character of the landscape. This was achieved with a clipped hedge along the highway, just high enough to shut off from the view of passers-by and cars, all but the treetops of the garden's natural hammock, arousing interest in what is going on behind that hedge. <clears throat> Manicured grass along the highway in front of the hedge set off the uh, neatly clipped hedge and occasional floral displays, clearly signaling a new possibility after miles of natural hammock. And I, I first experienced this contrast in 1952 on my first visit to Florida uh, while driving US-1. Uh, unfortunately, I could not find the picture because you still got that clipped edge um, <clears throat> and uh, that principle of contrast, although again, it's diminished because they're no longer miles of hammock. Uh, <clears throat> but Phillips understood the importance of the entrance gate and area uh, as giving the vista a brief chance to decompress from the highway and, and prepare for the uh, new sensations in the form of a Florida jungle. Uh, this is uh, an early uh, archival photograph of that entry. Uh, this is how it looks. Uh, in recent times, um, <clears throat> but um, the, the two slat sheds uh, formed a corridor, which would be a prelude to the jungle garden. Uh, <clears throat> they were uh, hung with uh, orchids in bloom. And Phillips was adamant that the ground between the sheds and the natural hammock be clear of everything but grass the beautiful, brilliant green of winter rye for seasonal visitors. In other words, a circular lawn about 100 feet in diameter with exotic palms and attractive blooming plants around the edges. This established the power of contrast. Phillips insisted on a visitors, uh, on a vista into the jungle, the native hammock, that would go from a point on the far side of the circular lawn opposite the corridor, formed by the slat shades and in line with it straight on into the jungle for several hundred feet with a cut narrowing with a, uh, as, a as it recedes. The, the principle of perspective really in, in uh, Italian art affording a deep and serious, uh, mysterious view into the jungle. Well, Phillips believed that nothing but rambling narrow trails through the hammock would become monotonous and advised a network of fairly direct paths from uh, one point of interest to another. And this I found fascinating. He said, as in the old French royal parks, I had never thought of this French influence uh, before in these uh, Florida landscapes, but uh, clearly that was in uh, Phillips' mind. <clears throat> Not as avenues, of course, he said, but, but clearly direct, even though the sides might be irregular. Well, <clears throat> recognizing that fear of snakes was clearly an issue, Phillips dictated that the paths be 10 to 12 feet wide and kept clear. Again, uh, the overriding principle 
uh, articulated by Phillips. The key is that of contrast, and you can certainly see that here. One of the magnificent uh, trees uh, here. And again, you see the contrast with the clear, uh, very bright green grass uh, in the distance. <clears throat> Advising the developer of the garden, Walden Sexton, he wrote, bear in mind, Sexton, that the mass needs the void to be effective. Well, the garden survived in its um, <clears throat> entirety until 1976, when developer Greed reared its head and 62 of the original 80 acres were sold and developed. The remaining section of the original garden, which included the highway entrance and uh, historic slat sheds were rescued in 1995 by the Indian River Land Trust and restored as much as possible within the smaller scope of the garden. <clears throat> and based on the study of, of Phillips' original uh, drawings. More recently, in order to, I guess, to keep things fresh and to have the locals returning as well as uh, new visitors. Um, <clears throat> McKee has uh, actively uh, collaborated with uh, an artist, I guess we can call a sculptor, Patrick Doherty. Another uh, view through the jungle. Patrick Doherty. Um, this is a sculpture that was done in uh, 2016, a site specific to um, McKee Jungle Gardens. Um, <clears throat> Patrick Doherty, you may be familiar with because he did an installation, uh, if we can talk about sculptures outside his installations, he did one for um, the Appleton in 2016. I've, I've seen his work all over the United States. Um, in fact, uh, in 30 plus years, he's done over 300 of these works. They're intended uh, to disintegrate. So they're not intended to be permanent. In that sense, I guess they're kind of performance pieces. Um, <clears throat> now this one at McKee in 2016 is called The Royals. Um, <clears throat> he, um, um, did one uh, this past year, which is called, this is the most recent one done in 2020, and I don't know how far it's dis disintegrated at this point. <clears throat> but um, this one is, I'm trying to find the name of it. Um, I haven't found it immediately. But uh, I'm gonna digress for a moment because uh, I think Doherty is one of the more interesting sculptors working in our country now. And this is my favorite work of his. Um, and this is uh, in Montana at a remarkable uh, new art center called Tippett Rise. Um, the nearest uh, small town is Fishtail, Montana. But it's a 12,000 acre working sheep and cattle ranch. Uh, now devoted to art, uh, music, uh, architecture, nature, all contributing to uh, the human experience. It's in the Bitterroot Mountains uh, or in the distance. It's quite, quite stunning. And <clears throat> this is actually the old schoolhouse from uh, uh, one room schoolhouse. And um, Doherty has created a sculpture here, uh, which is called Daydreams, I believe, um, which is both outside and inside. This is uh, looking out at the, the countryside. This is actually inside the school room. Uh, so you have this growing in from outside or in or inside to out, I'm not sure which. In any event, uh, a very interesting, uh, sculptor who is, I 
again, very prolific. You've probably seen his work around the country. Um, <clears throat> well, um, <clears throat> again, that's an attempt to, uh, to maintain fresh interests there. We move now to <clears throat> our final uh, landscape, Fairchild fair Tropical Gardens. And <clears throat> this is, uh, I learned a lot researching this. I thought I knew a lot and I was wrong about most of it. Uh, <clears throat> but from, again, from his home base in Miami, where he had moved upon completion of Bach Tower, uh, Phillips continued his collaboration with Olmsted Jr. up until Olmsted's retirement in 1949, he died a few years later in 1957. <clears throat> At the same time, and until Phillips' own death in 1966, Phillips undertook his own projects on a scale that is, is just breathtaking. Uh, institutional landscapes, such as the University of Miami campus, cemeteries, private clubs, numerous roadways and bridges, such as the Venetian Causeway and the Rickenbacker Causeway out to uh, Miami Beach, as well as hundreds of private residences and businesses. <clears throat> of these many, many landscapes, designers, other designers generally consider Fairchild, Fairchild Tropical Gardens to be uh, his masterpiece. Here, Phillips recalled that his first decision was to choose the principal families of plants to be exhibited. And he settled upon tropical, uh, which is not surprising given the location. He determined the tropical basis of the collections and made the decision to exhibit large shrubs and trees as families. With a close understanding of the site, Phillips applied landscape principles that engaged both the native context of vegetation, the hammock, as well as the tropical exotics that distinguished Fairchild tropical gardens. Uh, this ability to incorporate nature, what already existed there, underlies uh, Phillips' many contributions to the Florida landscape. And in researching the history of Fairchild Tropical Gardens, I discover, discovered I've been wrong about its uh, genesis uh, for decades. Knowing just enough to be dangerous about David Faircloth at Fairchild and his importance in the field of horticulture, I'd always assumed the garden was primarily his inspiration and effort, which is not true at all. Uh, <clears throat> certainly Fairchild had an interest and a presence in Florida. Uh, soon after his 1893 appointment by the United States Department of Agriculture's first office of foreign seed and plant introduction, he held a leadership role in the effort from 1906 until his retirement in 1928. And during this period, he traveled all over the world and was responsible for introducing approximately 75,000 selected varieties and species of useful plants into the United States. And only last year, I learned that he was responsible for the Japanese cherry trees around DC's tidal base. Um, <clears throat> a relationship with uh, Charles Deering led to a loan of 25 of the 212 acres of Charles's Buena Vista estate or Buena Vista estate uh, to the United States Department of Agriculture for the program headed by Fairchild. And um, Richard Farwell talked to us last uh, or in the third session, I think, about that first Deering effort in um, the Dade County area, uh, Charles Deering's uh, state uh, north of downtown Miami. Uh, an even more personal relationship with Florida began in 1916 when David and his wife Marion Fairchild bought one of the few properties available on the oilitic uh, 
Atlantic Coastal Ridge overlooking Biscayne Bay in Coconut Grove. While it might seem surprising that a government employee could afford a winter home in Coconut Grove to go with his home in Chevy Chase and a summer home in Nova Scotia, <clears throat> Marion Fairchild was not just any wife. She was a daughter of Alexander Graham Bell and had studied sculpture under Gutz and Borglum of Mount Rushmore fame. <clears throat> In addition, I'll back up, I didn't share the cherry blossoms with you very long, but uh, again, this is what uh, one of the many things David Fairchild was responsible for. In addition, Marion's mother, Mabel, was the daughter of the phone investor, Gardner Green Hubbard, a founder and first president of the National Geographic Society. Alexander Graham Bell was the second president, but his father-in-law was, was a founder and the first president. So Marion simply called her mother 10 days after seeing the property and asked for uh, and received the money for the property, which became known as the Campon. Uh, <clears throat> the Campon uh, reflects the fact that there were several properties scattered around, kind of like uh, a Campon in uh, Southeast Asia. Um, <clears throat> and here is uh, an example of a, <laughs> the Southeast Asian effect that you get. Uh, this is a view all the way to uh, this game bay, as I recall. Um, <clears throat> sometime in the 60s, the property was sold out of the family. And then in 1984, a subsequent owner, or that subsequent owner, um, gifted it to the National Tropical Botanical Garden, most of uh, which most of their properties are actually in Hawaii. But uh, this is now part of that inventory. So why is Fairchild Tropical Garden named Fairchild? Well, I think I'm ready for that one yet. Um, in 1934, led by Colonel and Mrs. Robert Montgomery, a group of friends first met with the idea of starting a botanical garden in honor of David Fairchild, who was a friend of the group. <clears throat> and William Lyman Phillips then developed a preliminary plan for the garden, which was published uh, with the dedication of the garden uh, in uh, 1938, March 23, 1938. <clears throat> in one of his uh, typically grand pronouncements, um, Yale's famous architectural historian pronounced the design inspired by Lenote's design for Versailles. And this um, is not so shocking when we bear in mind that Phillips himself had talked about the influence of French royal parks on his design at uh, McKee Gardens. Um, <clears throat> I haven't found a similar statement about Fairchild, but again, it, it's not so surprising. But I have to tell you that, that Vincent Scully has sent me off on many interesting tangents. As a penniless law student at Yale, uh, my major entertainment was uh, auditing Scully's architectural history courses. And on one occasion, he pronounced that Frank Lloyd Wright's plan of 1938 for Florida Southern College in Lakeland was based on uh, Hadrian's villa, uh, Tivoli, outside Rome. Uh, this sounded pretty far-fetched to me, 
but soon after I came here to teach in 1962, um, <clears throat> I uh, drove down to Florida Southern to, to see if I could see that. Well, certainly the buildings don't look that way, but um, <clears throat> he's really talking about axes and how it's laid out. Um, <clears throat> and uh, he, he describes the pivotal circular pool its long opening and closing diagonal axes with their colonnades, perhaps even the outdoor theater and top lighted buildings of many shapes, such as the chapel and library. From the published plans of Hadrian's Villa at Tivoli of the early second century AD. Well, <clears throat> um, after uh, having driven down to, to see Florida Southern, my first visit there. Uh, <clears throat> I followed this up in 1964 with a visit to Hadrian's Villa itself. I actually spent a week uh, at a little inn at Tivoli. Uh, and some of you will remember that in our uh, garden history course, we looked at the um, uh, 1500s, the Renaissance. Uh, Fountain complex designed at Tivoli. So you've got both uh, Hadrian's period represented there and uh, the Renaissance. But I guess it shows how suggestible I am that I have since felt challenged to pursue uh, Scully's pronouncements to other sites in, in Italy and in, and in Greece. Um, but I do believe that the aerial views of uh, Fairchild Tropical Garden provides some credence to uh, Sully's uh, pronouncement that uh, that Fairchild Tropical Garden is based on Lenoke's plan for Versailles. Basically, two formal axes with shaded walks, creating two parallel vistas linked by smaller paths and occasional views between them. Uh, here, as at McKee, uh, Phillips believed foremost in the principle of contrast, as expressed by the opposition of solids and voids, using contrast to attain variety. In the garden, <clears throat> the elaboration of voids was achieved with open lawns. I'll go back to an earlier, I thought, I guess it's further along. Um, but in any event, uh, clearly there is this elaboration uh, of open lawns, uh, the lakes, uh, any concavity that would contrast with the vertical uh, height of both the, the native hammock and the introduced palms. Well, once the Montgomery's had given the go-ahead uh, given the property, actually, 83 acres adjoining Matheson Hammock, Phillips <clears throat> um, supervised workers of the CCC in building the garden wall along uh, the highway, uh, the vine pergola, and the palm glade. In recent years, this is obviously uh, the cacti area. Uh, the palm glade. And in recent years, this is the vine pergola that was uh, built by the CCC. And this is a photograph of a particular, I think it's called a jade vine that I photographed a few years ago, hanging from that vine pergola. But in recent years, the uh, Fairchild Tropical Garden has um, increased membership enormously through its collaboration with the glass artist from Seattle uh, area, Dale Shahuli. And they first did this in 2006. They've done it again uh, more recently. But I'm going to show you a few photographs I took uh, at, the 19, at the 2006 collaboration. Uh, I've seen at least nine of Shahuli's garden collaborations around the world, twice in Kew, most recently last year, for the second time Kew uh, had Shahuli over. Uh, I think that uh, 
the installation at uh, Fairchild is is really the most successful of all the garden installations. Uh, <clears throat> this is uh, one of the main axes that uh, that Scully was talking about here with uh, one of uh, Shuley's glass creations in the foreground. Uh, here in the uh, succulent and desert area. Uh, here again in that same area. These uh, are in the sunken uh, garden at, at Fairchild, where he has used some of the, the balls that he refers to as Miyajima floats from the Miyajima area in southern Japan, where we find the Tory Gate. Uh, again, uh, tucked into the foliage. Uh, To me, this is probably the least successful. Very interesting form. And finally, the familiar boat that you find in every one of his uh, garden installations, but I think it's particularly effective here at, uh, at Fairchild Tropical Gardens. Well, with that, I'm going to close and thank you for all participating over the last several weeks. It's been a little bit irregular, uh, but life has been irregular for the past year. So I want to say that I could not have offered this course without Julianne's active participation. She has taken my photographs, photographs from books, uh, from here, there, and yonder, and uh, created uh, something I could use for giving these lectures. So thank you, Julianne, and thank all of you. Thank you personally, that was fantastic. Do we have any questions or comments? Yes, any questions? I'm kind of curious about uh, uh, finding the addresses of all the uh, locations of gardens that you have treated in this lecture to, you know, like Fairchild uh, Garden, because uh, I'm kind of interested in maybe driving down to see. All, yeah, all you have to do is Google each one and they will give you the directions. I see. Very easy. <clears throat> to find. Is there any possibility you could enumerate uh, the names of each of the gardens that you've covered in these series of lectures or, or is that yes yes i can do that and and uh julianne can send it out to the group yeah i uh, think that's would be a grand idea the the best single publication uh is one done at the university of miami several years ago and i'll also uh list that because it it includes uh lots of gardens that I didn't talk about, all in Florida. Um, it's, it's very scholarly. Um, it's, it's the most difficult book to hold physically that I have ever dealt with. It's, it's a very strange shape and size, and, but it is clearly the, the best thing on Florida landscapes if you believe that Florida doesn't go north of uh, Palatka because there is no mention of gardens in the Panhandle or, or the ones in Tallahassee. Um, it's as if we did not exist up here. But, uh, but anyway, I will provide that information for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you see the question about a book on Bach Tower? Bach Tower. Is, is there a good resource? Uh, the, the only book I have on Bach Tower, I'm sure there is a recent book on Bach Tower. The one I have uh, and relied upon is I probably bought 30 or 40 years ago. Um, if, uh, if you are interested, there's a wonderful little book of essays by the long time 
uh, director at uh, at Bach Tower Gardens, Ken Morrison, called Mountain Lake Almanac, which I've recently reread. Many of you probably know Sally Morrison, who was the longtime um, park specialist at Rawlings, and then when uh, the state acquired Dudley, she, she moved out there. Well, her father was the longtime director at, uh, at Bach Tower Gardens. And so uh, uh, anyway, it's, it's, it's a delightful reading. Um, <clears throat> Thank you for the list. Uh, it's, it's, I look forward to it. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Thank you so much, Roy. All right. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you again for the spring semester in a couple weeks. Stay well, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Roy. Thank you.